In section 7.2, we have a brief look at the nature of covalent bonding. Covalent bonding is the type of bonding that exists between non-metal atoms. It's also referred to as molecular bonding. The simplest covalent molecule is that formed between two hydrogen atoms. If we consider two hydrogen atoms separated by a very large distance, we would recognize that each hydrogen atom has one electron and a nucleus comprising one proton. If the distance between our two hydrogen atoms is significantly large, then these two atoms will be effectively not interacting at all. It's of interest to consider what happens is we bring these two atoms closer together so that the orbitals containing the electrons on each atom begin to overlap. So let's just keep in mind that the electron in the hydrogen atom is in a 1s orbital. So as the two atoms move closer together, there starts to be attractions and repulsions between the charged particles that make up the atoms. In particular, the electrons on the different atoms will begin to repel one another. This is a destabilizing effect. It's going to reduce the likelihood of these two atoms forming a bond between themselves. The protons on one, or the, the proton on one atom, will be attracted to the electron on its own atom, but also the electron on the other atom. That is, we will have what we call proton-electron attraction. And this is a force that will be stabilizing with respect to forming a molecule between the two atoms. So this is going to be kind of encouraging these atoms to become stuck to one another. The nuclei of each atom is composed of a single proton, and as these two atoms become closer together, those protons are going to repel one another, and this is something that's going to destabilize the formation of a bond between these two atoms. So the question becomes, is there an arrangement of particles where this sta um, stabilizing proton-electron attraction becomes the dominant force and the two atoms become stuck to one another? So if we continue to bring these atoms closer together so that their 1s orbitals overlap, and then we put the two electrons exactly halfway between each nucleus, we end up with an arrangement of particles where each nuclei feels an inwards attraction to the two electrons. And as a result, what we end up with is um, is a chemical bond between these two atoms. These two atoms become stuck together. So it turns out that there's an ideal arrangement of particles that gives the most stable molecule. And this occurs when there's a distance between the two nuclei of 74 picometers. And when the electrons spend most of their time exactly halfway between the two nuclei. So they spend most of their time right in there. Now, if I move the two atoms closer together than 74 picometers, then I start to increase the um, repulsions due to the proton-proton uh, repulsion. And so this kind of destabilizes my molecule. If I have them further apart than 74 mil um, picometers, then what happens is that I weaken the electron proton attraction and my bond gets weaker and again that energy there rises. So it turns out that the perfect arrangement of particles that maximizes the attractions while minimizing the repulsions is when the electrons sit in between the two nuclei and the two nuclei are exactly 74 picometers apart from each other. So what holds these two atoms together? It is the inwards attraction towards the two electrons that are shared by these atoms. So in many covalent bonds, the electrons are not shared equally. So when we have a covalent bond where we have an equal sharing of electrons, this is referred to as a polar covalent bond. So in the hydrogen molecule that we just looked at, the electrons they don't have a greater affinity for one or other of the two atoms in the bond, so they sit exactly halfway between the two atoms. A similar thing happens when I form a bond between two identical chlorine atoms. 
the electrons that are being shared, they don't have a greater attraction to one atom or the other, but they so they sit exactly halfway between the two atoms. When this occurs, whether it's in hydrogen or whether it's in chlorine, this is referred to as a non-polar covalent bond. Now, if I kind of combine these two and I form a bond between a hydrogen atom and a chlorine atom, it turns out that um, electrons have a greater affinity for chlorine than they do for hydrogen. So the two electrons that hold these atoms together are not shared equally. They spend more time closer to chlorine than they do to hydrogen. Electrons are negative and this gives a negative end to the bond that's closer to the chlorine. So we can indicate this in a couple of ways. One is we can use this delta notation where we indicate the negative end of the bond with a delta minus and the positive end of the bond with a delta plus. Or we can also indicate it with what we call a polar arrow where we have the um, we draw an arrow pointing to the more negative end of the bond and then just the and emphasize the point we make the other end of the the arrow into a plus sign so when we have an unequal sharing of electrons we have what we refer to as a polar covalent bond so the how do we know if we have a polar covalent bond or not and if we do have a polar covalent bond and um, how do we know what is the positive end and what is the negative end of that um, bond so the tendency of an atom to pull electrons towards itself that are being shared in a bond is called the atom's electronegativity. And it's differences in electronegativity that give rise to unequal sharing of electrons in covalent bonds. Now fortunately for us, electronegativity varies in a very systematic fashion across the periodic table. So how it works is this. As the nuclei of a small atom is closer to the shared electrons in a covalent bond, it is attracted more strongly to them. So our smallest atoms are up here. So fluorine has our greatest electronegativity and our biggest atoms are down here. So francium has our least electronegativity. So electronegativity is inversely proportional to atomic radii as radii goes up, electronegativity goes down. So there are a whole bunch of scales that have been devised to quantitatively express the electronegativity of an element. Perhaps the most successful are the relative electronegative val electronegativity values developed by Linus Pauling. Now, Linus Pauling is an interesting guy. He's a, a Pacific Northwest local. He comes from um, Oregon and he's the only person to have won two Nobel Prizes by himself in two completely different um, disciplines. So he won the Nobel Prize for Peace and he won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. Now um, another interesting fact about Linus Pauling is he never did graduate high school. He refused to commit and um, complete the humanities requirement because you know he was really more interested in math, physics, chemistry, stuff like that. Okay, so here are um, Pauling's electronegativity values and you can see that fluorine has the highest value with four and then down in the bottom corner here we've got francium with 0.7. So this is a pretty general kind of trend. Most of the elements um, follow the pattern nicely. You can see occasionally some of them are like it's hard to distinguish and um, the difference between the two classic one being um, carbon and sulfur and nitrogen and chlorine having the, um, the same electronegativity values. But generally for elements that are well separated on the periodic table, the differences in electronegativity are obvious. Okay, you can always have a table of electronegativity values um, available to you during any testing when we're doing um, online tests and, and quizzes. And of course, um, you may have um, recognized already that if you have a um, TI-84 um, color edition within the periodic table there, it actually gives you electronegativity values. So now we can characterize the, in how polar or non-polar um, an atom is um, on the basis of this uneven sharing of electronegativity, or uneven sharing of electrons, 
um, by using these electronegativity values. So in particular, what we're going to say is that if we have a difference in electronegativity of that's more than 1.8 between two atoms, we don't have sharing of electrons, we just have transfer. And the more electronegative atom is just stealing those electrons from the less electronegative atom. So this is what we're going to see between metals and nonmetals. And if I go back to that table there and we look at something like sodium with chlorine or even sodium with oxygen, we see these very large differences in electronegativity. That's carbon with oxygen. We see these very large differences in electronegativity. Between 0.4 and 1.7, we have what we call our polar covalent bonds. We've still got sharing of electrons, but it's uneven sharing of electrons. And so, you know, my rule of thumb here is, yeah, it has to be greater than 0.4 before we start seeing sort of significant impact of this uneven sharing of electrons. When we have a difference in electronegativity of less than 0.4, then the 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 uneven sharing of electrons really doesn't manifest in any obvious way as far as the chemical properties are concerned. So for us, what we're really saying is greater than or equal to a 0.4 difference in electronegativity, and then that's going to be a polar or ionic bond. Okay. So when do we get large differences in electronegativity? When we have metals combining with non-metals. And so in this case, we don't have sharing of electrons at all. We have transfer of electrons to the metal, to the non-metal, we form what we call ionic bonds. When we have small differences in electronegativity, like between the uh, non-metals themselves, then what we get is covalent bonds. We don't transfer electrons from one atom to another. Those two atoms will be sharing their electrons. Okay, so I assigned a couple of um, end of chapter homework exercises and I'll be working through those during the Zoom session later in the week.